to give some examples of why this talk even exists, right? So this is an example of a QR thread. Yeah, that's about the right reaction. Um, actually, the costs have been much higher for folks that have been hacked, but uh, the interesting thing about this thread is that when you read through it time after time, folks were like, yep, this happened to me. Uh, also interesting is that if you're hacked and you fail to do even some of the basic things that we're going to talk about here, you could be uh, fiscally responsible or financially obligated to pay that out and AWS won't refund you because you didn't do anything to uh, prevent this from happening. Um, so it's an interesting thread. Um, Codespace is very, very uh, well-known example of a company who just flat out went out of business after their AWS account was hacked. Um, and this was an interesting one. Uh, the moral of this story was small company, Rails developer, outsource development to somebody. That person uh, put the overly permissive, intended to be like S3 creds, but they were super overly permissive um, and gave access to the environment. They put that in the source code and then published that source code publicly. So just some examples. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm the CTO of a security company. We use AWS. This talk originated not, be, not only because of our needs, but what we kind of saw happening to companies, right? Um, but a lot of this is just sort of my uh, experience in trying to secure AWS. AWS does have a secure framework uh, guide. I encourage you to check it out. Um, and it kind of walks through some of this stuff, but this is sort of my interpretation of, uh, well, we'll walk through it. Some hopefully cool stuff. So I'm former military, uh, and I've talked about, if you're familiar with Rails Go, I created that. Uh, I've talked a lot about DevOps security. Um, if you're going to be at RSA, I'll be talking about uh, DevOps with Chris Gates. Um, uh, and we're going to be walking through different uh, DevOps tooling that's misconfigured and how we hack that stuff and how to secure it. Uh, so the general gist on how this is happening, I've kind of put the kind of categorized the common ways this occurs. One is through exposed credentials, leaked somehow. Um, misconfiguration, we're gonna walk through that, but that's really just you know, using AWS's services insecurely. And then vulnerable applications and systems, we'll walk through that as well, right? So exposed credentials. If you're a developer working in AWS, these are some common places where credentials are stored, right? Um, and <clears throat> if your box is stolen or lost, uh, and you haven't done some of the things we're gonna talk about, these files are open game. But interestingly, just doing a quick GitHub search, people were committing these files because they were like, I wanna back up my dot files to GitHub publicly. All right, so uh, in searching through for these files, I found like all these, those files I just mentioned and then the credentials. I should note that a lot of the credentials have been revoked because AWS does have bots scouring the web for exposed credentials and they try to protect you from this kind of stuff because it's very prevalent. Uh, here's some source code. I mean, I have so many examples of this. It's just source code with credentials inside of it. Uh, misconfiguration. So here's, uh, I want to give credit to Chris Gates here uh, for kind of talking about this and, and discovering it. Basically, he was using an enumeration tool to enumerate S3 buckets, right? If they exist, you can see some exist, some don't. Um, interestingly enough, the permissions on these buckets were set so that, you know, any authenticated user could access those buckets. But when we say any authenticated user, we don't mean like any authenticated user in your environment. You mean any authenticated user. So just be aware of, you know, things like that. We're going to walk through how to detect that and prevent that. But it happens over and over again, right? Like RDS, uh, so databases exposed publicly with default credentials. Um, security groups, which are like firewall rules, misconfigured, happens over and over and over and over again. Okay, so vulnerable applications to systems. Systems meaning unpatched, somebody used Metasploit or whatever, and they got a shell in that box. Uh, applications referring to an application that has maybe command injection, uh, remote code execution, something of that nature, which allowed an attacker to uh, get on the box. And once you're on the box, once you've compromised it, I think it's maybe well known. If not, we're going to cover it. Uh, but an attacker can grab metadata. Um, they can access metadata, which has security credentials in it. And from there, they can pivot throughout your uh, network. So um, this is an example of what 
URL you would browse to uh, if you had popped, we'll say, an EC2 instance. Uh, you can grab some credentials, and depending on uh, what cr those credentials have access to, that's where you're going to pivot. Uh, I'm going to butcher his name. The creator of W3AF, that's, that's, what, I'll, that's what I'll say. Uh, he had a black hat talk about doing this, so these slides are available. You'll be able to go view it if you haven't seen it. Um, but he built a tool to automate pivoting throughout networks. All right, so in summary, plenty of ways to get in. Happens all the time. Let's get started on talking about how to prevent it and detect it. We're going to go through monitoring and then hardening. We'll open it up for Q&A in the end. All right, so <clears throat> two, the two primary services we're going to talk about are CloudWatch and CloudTrail in terms of monitoring. Uh, I'm going to give you links to previous presentations where I go through like using config and I show you all these different setups uh, for CloudWatch alarms, but in this talk, we're going to kind of work with Lambda and whatnot. For CloudTrail, CloudTrail is essentially a log of all the activity that occurs within your AWS environment. At the very top here of this slide, you can see that if you access the AWS environment through the console or through the API, uh, you are touching some service, that activity gets logged to CloudTrail. It all dumps down in the bottom of CloudTrail. Uh, to get started with it, you just navigate to CloudTrail, turn it on, and there are some very easy configuration options, naming bucket that you want it to go to, et cetera. Um, it's going to ask you to um, give a log group name, and then you're going to allow it to create an IAM role. And we are going to talk about IAM roles, IAM roles at the, uh, towards the end of this presentation, how to use them. Uh, so I have a problem with the previous versions of this talk, and operationally, a problem with the fact that this is the best alert that I get, which is alarm threshold crossed. Uh, this is for unauthorized activity, by the way. Uh, threshold crossed, data point 1.0 is greater than your, doesn't help. I don't know who's doing what. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know what user did what. What they tried to access, I have none of that information. So this is what we really want. Right? We've got an IP address and event ID, so we can go into CloudTrail. We can parse through CloudTrail real quickly with that event ID and pull up the event and see what happened. But more importantly, we've got a source IP. We've got the AWS account that this occurred on, because if you're an organization who has multiple AWS accounts, which is pretty prevalent these days, you're going to want to know that. And then um, details on the user, what they tried to do. So now I'm pretty happy. By the way, this was not the easiest thing to, to, to figure out for me. Um, so hopefully you get some use out of this. Um, with alarms, what I want to explain real briefly is alarms, CloudWatch alarms trigger every time. You put in some filter, and they work. And every time something goes wrong or you, know, you have some malicious activity potentially, uh, they trigger. But again, the alerts are they're nothing to write home, home about. The events, however, so CloudWatch events and creating event rules, they are what I would describe as maybe a 90% solution. So they don't trigger every time, and this has to do with the intro. Has anybody had to deal with AWS events and the different formats of the JSON? Nobody? OK. So one, <laughs> one person, yay, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> basically, it's diff depending on the event source, meaning what uh, AWS service has been interacted with and what version of that event they're posting to, it looks a little different. So again, it's like a 90% solution. When we go to parse this, it may, uh, oftentimes it will work, sometimes it won't. So I just want you to be aware of that. That's why you want both alarms and events, uh, event rules. Uh, so for CloudWatch, we're going to go through setting up an IAM alarm for unauthorized, unauthorized activity. Um, we're going to set up a similar alarm for events, um, get those granular details that we want, and then uh, we're going to talk about some other events that you might want to monitor for. And we've already kind of beat that one. So going into CloudWatch, um, you've got logs on the left as well as metrics, and there are two different types of things that you're going to filter for, right? So logs, when you go to logs and we walk through this, we're going to show creating a custom alarm, a custom filter for that alarm. Uh, when you go into metrics, it's predefined things that AWS thinks that you probably would want to look for. For instance, billings under there. So if you go under metrics on the left, you'll go under billing and you'll pull out the metrics that you want, like if you exceeded a certain spend within a certain time frame. Anyway, so you go to logs, you choose the log group, uh, put in a filter pattern. This one is 
just says if the error code is unauthorized access or if it's uh, um, access denied, then we're going to go ahead and trigger an alarm. Uh, assign a metric to that. Give it some naming convention, very simple stuff to follow. Uh, and then at this point, after you've created that filter, like what you want to look for, then you go in and create the alarm. And when you go in to create an alarm, this example shows we've got, we've got the name, I, you know, description, um, and we give it somewhere to go. Meaning if this alarm gets triggered, at the bottom left, you can see that we send it to some SNS group. And that's just a notification service. And depending on the type of activity that you want to alert on, you may want that to be a text message. You may want that to be an email or some, something else. So that's what SNS essentially gives you. And as I said, it works really well. Um, and it will not fail on you. I've never had this uh, fail, and it's not been an issue. Here is an example of the details. And if you actually were to review the raw event from a CloudWatch alarm, again, this is what it looks like. It's just metric information. It's, again, nothing that you can really use. Actually, it doesn't even give you event ID. I mean, it's, it's not the greatest. So a little upset about that. All right, but then I learned about CloudWatch event rules. So, we're going to basically walk through um, creating a rule, uh, setting up the Lambda and Slack integration, parsing the event, and then doing something from there. So um, the way this would work is you go to CloudWatch, go to the event rules on the left side. And this is what an event typically, <laughs> sorry, I had to redact a lot, but um, it's essentially a JSON blob. But it's, very inf it's a very informative JSON blob. So this is what we're going to parse for to send to Lambda. How this came about was actually, has anyone ever tried to do this, like gone to this link and tried to actually automatically, fantastic, fantastic. try to automatically revoke um, access to somebody's account based off of an IAM alert saying there's unauthorized activity? Has anyone tried that? Okay, well, it's a good way to get started. It kind of helped credit to the per person that wrote this because it really helped me get started. Uh, it's pretty cool. So uh, essentially, someone tries to do something specifically in IAM. No other event source, not like EC2, nothing else. Specifically in IAM, they try to do something. They don't have permissions to do anything in IAM. And so at that point, you revoke their access. That's the general gist of that link. I would check it out. But it's not exactly what we want. We want those event details. So before we get into that, we've got to talk about Lambda and we've got to talk about Slack. So three pieces to this, we got to configure the Slack webhook. We have to grab the URL for that webhook. And because we're not going to store a sensitive piece of information like a webhook URL, which is essentially credentials, in plain text and source code, we've got to use KMS, which is the key management service from AWS, in order to encrypt that URL and then be able to access it via our Lambda function. So in Slack, go in, start configuring your uh, incoming webhook. Uh, add some configuration details. I put like a little image, gave it a, a name, things like that. Um, and choose the, the room. You know, this is an engineering room I'm, I'm trying to send these notifications to. Choose the room. And then you've got a webhook URL. Pretty useful. Now, on the KMS side of things, it's like a four step process. You go in, you create a uh, KMS key. And you add in some details. Uh, one of the things that's not shown on here is that you set up a role for uh, you name it the role appropriately. And that role essentially is going to allow Lambda, the Lambda function, to call out to this KMS key and decrypt it so that you can make your calls to Slack. So um, after you've gotten the, um, this configuration set up, the KMS encrypt, and you follow those very easy to follow steps, um, you've got to provide some information. You've got to use the AWS CLI to uh, go ahead and encrypt that URL. Um, it's very easy to follow. and um, very hard to see from here, but uh, basically you're giving it the name of the KMS key that you're, you're wanting to uh, encrypt. What it gives you back is a ciphertext block. That's the important thing to take away from this slide. A big ciphertext blob is essentially an encrypted uh, webhook URL with uh, base64 encoding to normalize the, the data. So we'll have to go into uh, Lambda and kind of talked about the fact that there will be a need to decode and decrypt this uh, URL. So when you go into Lambda, you can, um, by the way, if you've never dealt with Lambda and you've never dealt with templates, they've got templates for everything. Uh, this is 
for our purposes, I'm going to give you the code so you can just go in and create a, a blank function or a blank template. Um, just choose the default. All, that's all you need to do here. And then this gist has all of the code. Basically, when you paste in the code that I've given you, you know, you've got some, again, it's just easy stuff like a name, description, but the important part is in this code, there are two pieces that you want to fill in. One is the webhook URL, uh, that blob, that ciphertext blob, and the other is just the name of the engineering channel that you, or the name of the Slack channel that you actually want to uh, post these messages into. And then this is the point at which you choose the role, the role that's going to be able to call KMS and decrypt this specific key. So let's do it. Yay. So interesting fact here, if you've never, if you've never dealt with this, um, it, took me, it took me like an embarrassing, embarrassingly long time to figure this out, but when you go to create a rule and you choose your event source, um, there's a predefined, like I can only take events from X ser uh, services, right? From X uh, uh, event sources. However, if you directly go and click this adv show advanced options, which again, it was it took me a little longer than it should have, uh, you've got an edit option, and then you can directly edit the JSON, and that's what we're gonna do. So when you directly edit the JSON, this is where that parsing comes into play when those event JSON blobs start to change. It may or may not catch it. I, again, I would say probably 90% 90, 90 of the time it's caught it for this specific event, uh, unauthorized activity. So you put in the same things you did before with the error code uh, being like unauthorized, or sorry, access denied and uh, unauthorized operation. And then most importantly, at the end, you choose the function you want to send it to. Um, so our target is going to be the Lambda function that we created. And at this point, give it a name, give it a description and test. So. Um, this is us going in with an account that has no permissions, it shouldn't be able to access anything, and it's trying to create a user. And this is the output of that. So hopefully that's of some use. That, uh, that should give you some information on, on how to no notify folks pretty immediately. I've, I've, before this, when we were using CloudWatch alarms, the process was we get an alert, and then we're like, who did what? You know, who's, who's going in there and, and tinkering? And then we have to go back through the logs, and it's this long process. So. Yay, I'm happy. Okay, so CloudWatch takeaways. Um, pretty, pretty simple. Edit, go into the event rules, create something you want to parse for, uh, go through the, document, the lengthy documentation to figure out exactly what you want to do, um, and set up both. Most importantly, do not dismiss alarms. Use both alarms and event rules. Um, in the previous, so I mentioned previous talks. Um, these are just some things that I think at a minimum every organization should be checking for. Um, for instance, if you're billing, if, you, if your normal spend is like $1,000 a month, probably if overnight it goes up to $50,000, there's an issue. Um, in terms of root account usage, this isn't actually, so this is actually an interesting one because I didn't realize so many people were using uh, root accounts operationally. And if you are using them operationally, stop, don't do that. Um, and then alert on it if they are used. And uh, we did this internally, and what's interesting is if anybody ever uses the root account for any reason, sometimes in a very remote situations, it's, it's necessary. Uh, and if they don't tell somebody that they're gonna use it, we all light each other up. It doesn't matter what time of the, the day it is. We're, in the sense of we're all like, who did what? You know, who, who's doing this? You know, we don't know about it. So it's kind of, kind of this alert created almost a, uh, culture of urgency, uh, if that makes sense. And then failed login attempts. Um, that's just a simple one if someone's trying to brute force, which we are going to talk, talk about multi-factor authentication in this talk. So, hardening. Um, if you've never checked out Amazon's free resources, they do have a security fundamentals free like CBT that you can go through, and it helps walk through, not at a granular level, the things we're talking about, but at like a high level, as somebody who may just need to put out some policies and make sure that the, the folks who are doing technical work um, are, are doing, you know, doing the proper things, it's a good resource. Um, we're gonna talk about hardening now, uh, moving on from monitoring. So like I said, don't use the root account. Uh, every environment has one, don't use it. Uh, if it absolutely has to happen, set up the alar alarm and then notify your team first before you have to use it. Um, Disable or delete the access keys. There's no reason that the root account would need those access keys. And um, I guess that's really all to talk about on that. Now, when we talk about 
auditing IAM permissions. Has anyone had the joy of auditing IAM permissions for their AWS environment? Yeah, super fun. Yeah, so this is the basic breakdown of a single user. A single user can have managed policies, they can have inline policies, they can belong to groups, multiple groups, that each have managed policies and inline policies. Yeah, that's about how I feel about that. It's terrible, doing that work stinks. I'll give you some code though to make this easier. So uh, for managed policies, essentially their uh, policies can be attached to multiple users or groups. And for inline policies, it's just for one specific person, it's specific to that person. This uh, just has code in it that will allow you to create a CSV file, um, provides you with usernames, inline policies, managed policies in a detailed JSON structure, and then the groups that they belong to. Here's the tool output, and this is real data. This is sanitized, um, you know, change the, the names to protect the guilty type deal. That's one person. Oh my God, it stinks. And one thing, and we're gonna talk about encrypted volumes, and one thing we realized was like, okay, well, we're, you know, these folks are storing all of this sensitive PII and financial data on EC2 machines that have unencrypted volumes, EBS volumes, and, uh, you know, theoretically people shouldn't have, you know, the wrong people shouldn't have SSH access to those boxes, but then they have the ability in these, with these permissions to then attach these spun down EBS volumes to an instance they do have access to, so going through these permissions, determining where sensitive data, sensitive data is stored and then like who has access to it can be quite a challenge. That's pretty much how I feel about that. So auditing user policies. Um, it's kind of what I just said. Audit where your sensitive data is, figure out who has access, and figure out what uh, that access could allow in kind of like a, a theoretical way. A uh, threat model, right? That's essentially what it is. All right, multi-factor authentication. All right, so this is essentially two-factor. I had somebody make a joke about like, oh, is there like three, four different types of authentic, uh, authentication? No, this is, it's just their, their terminology. It's two-factor authentication. You can use virtual apps like Duo or Google Authenticator, or you can get hardware devices from Jamalto. Um, so let's set this up, and then I'm gonna move into the more important, in my opinion, more important piece, which is the API and multi-factor authentication. All right, so to get this done, um, you navigate to the security credentials section under IAM. Um, you go to manage an MFA device. Uh, select the virtual device or hardware device. Uh, if you've selected a virtual device, it's just a QR code for Google Authenticator. Enter in the authentication code twice, and now MFA is on your account. But anybody who's actually had to do this realizes uh, that is a pain. Um, so if you don't have IAM access, you can't do that to your account. So what do you do? You're like, hopefully not screen share or send emails with pictures of a QR code to an admin, which does happen, um, we found. And so uh, there is a way to get around that, and that is to use this policy and attach that to a user, and then at that point, they can manage their own device. Everybody got that? All right, I got a link in here for that policy. You can change some details specific to that user, attach it to their attached to that user and that user can manage their MFA device, but they can't do anything else. All right, so if you need, and you totally should need, uh, you know, if you've got multiple people who need access to root account, you should be using the TOTP protocol to your advantage and, you know, share out the two-factor code for that, uh, for that account, for that root account. All right, so this is where we get into the, the, the stuff that's a little bit uh, interesting. So when um, leaked credentials occur, and somebody's accessing the uh, environment, typically it happens through the API, right? Um, you've got access keys, that's what it gives you access to is the API. So most of the time, if people do enable multi-factor authentication, I say most of the time, and just in my experience, most of the time, right? Um, people will use MFA for the console, but not necessarily for the API. And, you know, this isn't really a problem, right? Nobody, developers don't store keys in source code, right? Not an issue. Uh, so how to, how to actually enable this on the, uh, uh, the individual or the policy that you want to attach this to, if you want to put it on like the admin policy or whatever, this line specifically is the important one. And when you put that on, you effectively say, uh, hey, I am going to require that if you log into the console or if you try to access the API, now you have to use multi-factor authentication. So Google Authenticator, whatever. Uh, I feel like there's something I missed there. 
and we're good. All right, so uh, doing this at first can be painful, uh, very painful. Um, things that used to work will not, and that is just the way it works, but security token service, if you've never used it, essentially uh, what happens is you, you give it some credentials and it gives you back a new set of credentials that last for as long as you are okay with them, however long it's configured for. Um, so you give it your access key ID and secret and a uh, two-factor authentication code, and then you get back some new credentials. This uh, just right here is code that shows you how to do that. This is what it looks like. This is just a basic proof of concept, obviously. It's not, you know, you wouldn't be using this every day. Um, but like I said, all of the uh, things that you need to fill in there, the region that you want to log into, access key ID, secret. Uh, the serial number is important because when you set up that MFA device, you get back this long ARN, and that's what this serial number is looking for. It's looking for this very long piece of information that says this is the MFA device attached to, you know, associated with these keys, and this is what you're going to use, and here's your two-factor authentication code. Here's the output of the script. So, like I said, you get an uh, access key ID, a secret, and then a session token, which is a, another big long blob, and you use those three things in, uh, in tandem to, to access the environment. Uh, this is just an example of using the old EC2 describe instances tool, uh, just to show you that it works, that you can still use things as you would normally. And in case you don't like Ruby, it's for you, specifically for you. Um, I don't care, it's, it's, uh, people use it. No, but uh, all jokes aside, uh, this is like Python and Bash a combination, and the point of this repo is to basically oper operationalize what I just talked about so that every day, um, folks can, can go through the process of getting new credentials easily and uh, work without having these uh, creds that they're you know, exposing. So um, Elastic Beanstalk does not work with STS, but there is a workaround. If you use code pipeline, you can pull from um, GitHub, you can pull from um, code commit, uh, S3, and then essentially if you push to whatever branch that you're triggering on in that repo, uh, it'll pull your code in, and then you don't have to deal with STS, because again, it just doesn't work with Elastic Beanstalk. Or didn't the last time I checked. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, essentially it, it, it's only going to uh, protect you against the web and not the API unless you set up that policy that I, I showed you in the IAM piece there, that little one-liner, that conditional. All right, so this is IAM rules. Uh, Okay, so roles, if you've never worked with them, they're like a user, right? They've got, they've got something, some set of things that they can access. Um, the difference is, is you don't need to put credentials in your source code. Uh, the credentials rotate, and you can be very specific in what that role can access. Um, it, it's, it's very useful. Um, as, as I said, the credentials automatically rotate via STS. That, so the, the interesting thing is the thing that kind of like, hurts you, right, where an attacker can get on the box and they can go to that link and they can grab those credentials. That's kind of actually how roles work. Um, so it's like a double-edged sword, I'd say. Um, if you're using AWS SDK, like a gem or a Python egg or whatever the case is, um, all of this is handled for you as long as you're using that code. So what I mean to say is if you attach a role to an instance and you make some calls with that code, it'll recognize that you've got these temporary credentials use them, and then again, you don't have to hard code uh, your keys inside your source. If you're using something like Paperclip, um, you're gonna wanna use Fog, because Paperclip and this whole setup don't mix, but if you use Fog, you'll be all right. There's a link on that. And again, not the easiest to see, but here's an example of a policy. It's a very granular policy that says you can only access these things for this role, and you set that up with an IAM when you create the role. And then uh, this is an example of using Elastic Beanstalk. Just this is one example. You can do this with EC2 instances. You can really apply this wherever you want. Um, and in this is a, this example, we're just going into the configuration of that Elastic Beanstalk machine, dropping down, uh, choosing the uh, specific role that does some things. In this instance, this role was built to spin up some EC2 machines and to make some, uh, you know, CloudWatch alarm changes and things of that nature. But that's all I can do. Uh, and this is sort of like a miscellaneous section, right? Um, so this code right here that you'll have access to uh, essentially just allows you to automate the process of looking for and sorting unencrypted volumes, EBS volumes, and then encrypted volumes. Again, incredibly important um, if you're housing sensitive information on an EC2 box. 
Um, and then this one is to review S3 buckets uh, to determine the policy attached to them. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, essentially, just know that if you need to store some sensitive information uh, in S3, you don't need to rely on somebody doing their due diligence and like clicking the encryption option and all that. You can actually enforce that on buckets. So if you're a security person and you want to enforce that everybody's going that route encrypting and encrypting whatever they're placing in S3, you can create that policy and uh, attach it to that bucket. So in summary, I really do hope this talk uh, was helpful for all of you. I really mean that because uh, um, there's no point in me coming up here if, if it isn't, so I do hope it was useful for you. Um, there's uh, many things that we could talk about. We chose monitoring hardening, but would, one thing I kind of cut out was disaster recovery, and I was actually afraid about uh, afraid, uh, afraid I exceed, exceed my time limit, so I put this link in. It's a really great talk from DerbyCon about how to deal with incident response and disaster recovery should the worst happen, which you should always have a plan, right? Um, you can do all the things in the world, but there's always that chance something goes wrong. So have a plan. Now I'll open it up for q and A. I I know I went, went a little fast and we're done early, so awesome. Question. Sure. So the question was, can I put the slide link back up? I'm going to do that right now. All right, that's the link. Any other questions? Wow, all right, cool. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Uh, oh, we have a, yeah. Thank you. Application, what we are hosting, hosting on this, how that will, uh, open the loopholes to get to the accounts, right? Um, so two questions. One, uh, this itself, how much effort or you know approximation uh, in terms of whatever the scripting and the automation you did? So uh, how long does it take, how many people? And second is, how much work still need to cut out in terms of the application, what we're gonna host on those to make sure that that doesn't end up affecting this part? Okay, so my approximation of the folks, I mean, if you, if you set up monitoring like that, that's not that hard, right? And again, follow these links and that's just initial setup. Uh, at that point, I mean, really, it's just a, a process of having people that respond to that, is what I'd argue. I guess it's, it's, the configuration itself is easier than the actual response. And, and again, that's why I sort of like put in that Slack notification or whatever you wanna do using Lambda, however you wanna notify people instantly because the overhead associated with some of this stuff, uh, like if you enable config, which we, we, we didn't talk about, which is like asset inventory, the, the noise is incredibly high and it's hard to filter out that information. So it's not hard to do the configuration, it's hard to keep up with the notifications is sort of my synopsis on that. I was just wondering some of the thing, what you mentioned to have the EBS volume encrypted and uh, some of those uh, uh, protections like those. So. Uh, or the S3 itself, but the, let's say if we have the application what we host, they do themselves encrypt the database uh, or whatever they're using uh, to store the data, then is that an, another level of encryption you still recommend? Uh, like a protection you still recommend or uh, it's okay to leave it up to the, the, the application which is actually hosted on those uh, AWS itself? Because it affects the performance and latency, that's what I'm saying. Are you talking about like, I'm sorry, to, it's kind of hard for me to hear. Um, are you saying, uh, should you enforce encryption on like RDS or uh, enforce encryption on various services? Is that what you? Yeah, I mean, e even the, the encryption uh, on the volumes itself, right? right? If some of them are not encrypted, right? right? But then what we store on the volume itself, we encrypt that part, then do we need to have the whole volume encrypted? No. Encrypt just a piece of the volume? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, in what way? Uh, we can take it offline, but yeah, I mean. Sure, yeah, uh, we can talk about yeah, this offline. Yeah, yeah. yeah all right. Sure. Yeah, because I have a feeling that goes deeper than yeah. Yeah, this, this. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah we gotta get it. I'm just used to repeating back. 
so, so you mentioned uh, CloudTrail um, does certain uh, number of, uh, like it covers a number of actions and services. Is there any kind of known holds? Like I've used CloudTrail to audit and stuff like that, and it felt like I wasn't seeing everything. Is there any kind of known holes or known areas that you need to supplement? So um, <clears throat> I've not heard that one yet, that CloudTrail might be missing some pieces. Um, I would add that you should enforce VPC flow logs. You should enable VPC flow logs because actually uh, I had somebody do that and they reached back out and they're like, yeah, the second I turned that on, I realized that people are scanning us all day long, right? Because it's network level information that they're, they're catching. So to augment, I guess what I'm saying is to augment, um, to augment the CloudTrail logs, enable VPC flow logs. I didn't talk about it because I don't want to, you know, I, I, again, I was actually really afraid on time. Um, but Splunk, I have in the link to those previous uh, talks, I have a link to how to configure in Splunk the setup with like SQS and SNS and so that uh, Splunk can get all of the information and you can configure Splunk to alert it, alert on it. So that is a backup that I use. I have Splunk, I have all of this information as well. Jason, what's up man? Thanks for coming. around FIM on AWS, uh, like file integrity monitoring, and then what you do there? Using AWS or something else? Using AWS, is there a tool suite that you use there or, or a third party that you would suggest using? Not on AWS, no. Okay. Uh, for a third party, um, I honestly, I'm probably not the, uh, the, the, the best source on that. Cool. Yeah. I try to keep it pretty specific to AWS. So again, another part of it is like I was trying not to throw a bunch of brands in here, so that people are like, "Oh, I don't want to look like a NASCAR I mean, sponsored sense, yeah. by." So, cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate. it. I hope you got something out of this. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.